Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm going to go right out on the limb and take a chance and start this thing and let our technology catch up with us. So good morning. Thank you for coming. And uh, welcome to our panel on interest rates. Um, as Richard just said, I'm John Healy. Uh, my company is Hyde Street Holdings. I'm a ULI trustee, and I'll be moderating um, the panel. Uh, we have been living in a world of low, steady interest rates and very low capitalization rates for uh, core assets in gateway cities. We're all wondering where are interest and capitalization rates headed, and how soon are they expected to change? How can owners and developers manage these changes and still continue to drive up property values and company profits? We have with us today a very active and experienced group of real estate leaders, each of whom is actually ex executing a business plan in this uncertain interest rate environment. While interest rates are only one of many, many economic variables that are impacting buy, sell, redevelop, develop, or just hold the, and work the portfolio decisions, the fact that interest rates have been artificially low for an extended period makes the anticipated timing of an upward move and impact the focus of our discussion. I refuse to be distracted by this. <laughs> <laughs> Most most, most of you are, are active in the market, just like our panelists. So please, as, as Richard mentioned, you know, share your comments, um, especially interject with contrary opinions, because that's really what this is about. Nobody really knows the, 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 the answer to these questions except for Victor, and he's going to tell us what's going to happen. But the rest of us don't, so please you know, agree and disagree um, as you feel, feel free to do. Um, to frame our discussion, we are going to start with an economist. Um, who will present a consensus view of uh, interest rates. Uh, so nothing is easy or straightforward or without controversy. And so then we're going to take a look at what makes up the consensus, what variations are, are within that. After that, we're going to have a presentation briefed by our panelists who are going to outline their thoughts on their individual business plans. And that's where we hope we're going to get into it. So the bios have been already supplied on the, the ULI website, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be brief. Uh, Victor Kalinog, right here, right next to me, is Vice President and Head of Economics for, uh, for Reese. Um, his responsibilities include market forecasting, valuation, portfolio analytics. His experience with um, econometric analysis and urban e economics, fiscal policy, and credit risk, hopefully will ensure an accurate forecast. Um, all of our remaining panelists um, uh, are ULI trustees and, and, and leaders. Um, John Hagestat, Managing Director of Saros Regis, uh, which is in office industrial and apartments. John oversees all of the firm's commercial operations, including development, investment, and management uh, divisions. Doug Lyons. Um, Doug is Managing Director of Pearlmark Real Estate uh, Partners, which is a private equity firm in office retail, industrial, and multifamily. He's responsible for the firm's capital markets, portfolio management, and debt activities, and is a member of the firm's management and investment committees. That's a big job, Doug. Um, Barham Montemedium. Um, Barham is managing director in portfolio uh, management. He's USAA real estate. He works in all major property types throughout the United States. In addition, he directs separately managed accounts and is advancing the company's international investment strategy. Barham was formerly with Heinz, where he worked domestically and internationally. Last but not least, James Curtis. He's referred to as Curtis. I don't know why, he just has one name. He's like Madonna or Prince. Uh, but in any event, he's a managing partner, founder of the Bristol Group. He focused on two areas, the purchase and development of industrial properties, concentrating on the supply chain of goods, and the acquisition, development, and redevelopment of high-value, value-add investments in a wide range, a very wide range of asset types. So with that, I think we're we ready to go. Victor, yep. Victor, will you tell us what's going to happen? Absolutely. I'll tell you everything about what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, I was supposed to have three slides here, but you know what? I'll make do without the PowerPoint slides, as it typically doesn't necessarily enhance an economist's presentation anyway. So I'm going to attempt to answer three questions here, which would hopefully be of importance to everyone in the crowd, including our speakers. Number one, when will interest rates begin to rise? Number two, do you believe that interest rates and cap rates 
move in a coincidental or directly proportional direction? And number three, when will the next recession hit? Some pretty big questions, right? All right, so let's get started. Number one, when will interest rates rise? Well, it really depends. What interest rates are we talking about, right? If you take a look at 10, 20, 30-year treasury rates upon which many real estate decisions are built, at least in the US, sad to say they've begun to rise as early as May of 2013, right? The 10-year treasury hit a low of about below 2% at around April of 2013. And after the Federal Reserve began even intimating the idea of pulling back on uh, mortgage bond purchases, by the way, it's not even contracting, it's actually really just tapering down, uh, long-term interest rates began to anticipate that and began to rise. So hopefully for you guys, individually speaking, I hope at least for those who own property in the US, I hope you got your refinancing decisions done middle of last year because fewer great deals are out there because longer term interest rates have already begun to rise. Short term overnight borrowing rates, at least the policy variable that the Federal Reserve controls, however, have been hugging zero. And for the most part, consensus expectations are such that even the members of the Federal Open Market Committee show uh, some consensus about keeping overnight borrowing rates low at least through around next year or even early 2016. So if you're looking at the yield curve, which was the first slide I was supposed to show, right, you've got an upward sloping yield curve where you've got short-term interest down here and long-term interest rates up, rates up there. Uh, is that good news? An upward sloping yield curve from Econ 101? Yes, right? Economically speaking, that means that markets expect economies to grow positively. If you expect a recession, you expect a downward sloping yield curve. So at least in the near term, we don't expect any recessions through 2016. Now with that said, it still does imply a rising interest rate environment. And that's not necessarily good for many of us who have been en enjoying the punch bowl a little bit too much over the last three or four years. Uh, we have been in major competition across property types and various markets, especially in gateway cities. Uh, let me ask you then, for cap rates, which have been very low, especially for specific property types. I already told you that long-term interest rates started rising middle of last year. Have cap rates gone up from your experience? No, no. right? No. In the summer of 2012, I, I, my colleagues and I published a paper which showed that during inflection points, in other words, during times when interest rates are either at an extended high or extended low, and then things change with interest rate policy, once interest rates begin to rise, right? Cap rates actually move in a negative proportion to interest rates. For in some markets, cap rates may even fall or stay flat. When I presented this result in late 2012 to one of the research conferences, much like this, I got proverbial tomatoes thrown at me. Right? So, yeah, why is that? Well, why is it that cap rates would move in reverse fashion to interest rates when we all seem to think that, you know what, cap rates should follow interest rates, right? Well, uh, what I'm saying is that in the long run, right, in the long run, a higher interest rate environment should imply a higher cap rate environment to the extent that residential or commercial real estate is a riskier asset vis-a-vis -vis safer treasuries, right? But in the long run, as Keynes famously said, we're all dead. In the short run, what happens? Well, interest rates tend to be a policy variable, right? Which move in response to economic conditions, whereas cap rates are a residual. After market conditions have been assessed, buyers and sellers come together and agree at, at some price, and then you calculate the cap rate as the, as the residual. And what I'm saying here is, during times of change, when interest rates begin to rise or fall, Sometimes cap rates will stay flat for a window of about 12 to 24 months. That's what we found in our research, covering about 35 years worth of interest rate inflection points. But weren't interest rates uh, abnormally low? Yes. And so you had uh, the widest spread, spread yep. that we've ever seen between cap rates and interest rates. That's right. And so now we've, we've eaten into that to a point right now where you have a more normalized spread between cap rates and interest rates. So the which argument would suggest here is that, that right, the argument we don't here is have that much it's, more it's not just go. levels, it's the spreads, right? 
Whereas our spreads rose to about 450, 500 bips. We were used to 250, 300 bips. You've got long-term interest rates up 100 bips now or a little bit more. And now we're, we're running out of room. We're running out of runway. And the, the answer, that's precisely right. Because long-term interest rates rose in May of 2014. Sorry, May of 2013 last year. Surprise, it's been a year. Right? So we are running out of that runway. We need to prepare, I think, for that higher interest rate, uh, higher cap rate environment, which should come soon. Okay? Hard to say when. Okay? And the, game, and the game that a lot You're of the our... Economist. Yeah, tell I'll, I'll tell you when the next recession will be. The game that a lot of our clients play, which I think Jim will actually... Uh, uh, Curtis, sorry, will address directly is this, right? If you are going to encounter higher exit cap rates, when you... Uh, when you divest yourself of your investment, whether it's a five or 10 year holding period, what kind of NOI growth should you expect from specific property types? What should make the deal make sense given that you're gonna take a hit in value? Uh, I'm gonna pass it off to the real experts here after I answer the next question. When is the next recession supposed to hit, okay? Uh, would, here we have to look deep into the crystal ball and go and say, look, for the past eight to 10 cycles, when the Federal Reserve began ratcheting up the overnight borrowing rate, Okay, it only took anywhere from eight to 12 months for the next recession or economic contractionary period to hit. Okay, so when the Federal Reserve raises its overnight borrowing rate, in eight to 12 months, typically a recession hits. I am not saying that the Federal Reserve causes recessions any more than I'm saying that when I wrote a Christmas card, I cost Christmas. Right? This is precedence, <laughs> not causality. Wait a minute, that's confusing. Right, it's A versus B, <laughs> yeah, B causes on. A, yeah. right? What I'm saying is that, all right, if those temporal relationships hold true and overnight borrowing rates begin to rise in late 2015, early 2016, you might expect, and I'm not gonna make a judgment here as to how severe the downturn will be, hopefully it wasn't like 2009, you should expect some kind of slowdown in economic growth by 2016 or early 2017. <laughs> the last slide I was going to show was Moody's Economy.com's <coughs> treasury rate forecast, 10-year treasury rate forecast. And you can actually see that in 2017, the 10-year treasury starts dipping. So even on their end, they're expecting some sort of situation where 10-year treasuries will begin to take a dip. Maybe we'll see a bit of economic contraction then, although I need to call Mark Zandi right now because everything else in his forecast actually shows not an economic contraction, but more of a slowdown in hiring <laughs> or a slowdown in GDP growth. I don't think a lot of forecasters are fond of actually nailing down, yeah, this year GDP is going to fall. And I'm not one of them either, but if you ask me to go out there, go out on a limb, late 2016, early 2017, depending on when we begin tightening monetary policy from an explicit point of view. Not just tapering on mortgage bond purchases, but literally raising the overnight borrowing rate. That's the general landscape. Again, some counterintuitive results we're seeing in cap rates right now. Some breathing room for folks who entered with sub five deals, right? But that runway seems to be getting shorter and we might run out by later this year if our predictions hold true, right? 18 to 24 months of flat cap rates, then they begin to rise. Okay, Jim. Well, you know, um, Victor, um, that's a little scary because we're just sort of getting into it. We're buying some, some product, we're starting to make deals, and you're telling us that in a couple of years we're, we're heading down again. So are you sticking with that? I'm sticking with it. All right. You know what? I would love to be wrong on the upside, right? In 2017, we could all be gathered here, same faces, maybe a little bit more hair over here, right? Uh, and I can go and say, wow, I totally missed the recession. I think, I think there's one thing that, from my perspective, there's one thing that Victor's missed, and that's the political environment. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about an increase in interest rates in, in 15, latter part of 15, early part of 16, when you're going right into a, a, president, a, a crucial presidential election. And we all know that the government, you know, spikes the, the economy, you know, before an election to get their party elected. So I, I, I don't necessarily agree with your perspective, but. But it's very practical. Yeah. So um, isn't the Federal Reserve completely independent of politics? <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Okay, so we, we'll hold your questions for Victor for a minute. And let, let's shift over to um, somebody who's actually putting money at risk yeah. for their forecast. So um, John, would you like to tell us what you're doing? Sure. Uh, what we do is a little bit different than, than what everybody else in the panel is. Jimmy is 
probably the closest what we do. We're a traditional developer, and we, we develop two types of product type. We develop industrial products and apartments. And um, I mean, our, our modus operandi is to form, go out and find product or find land, uh, conceptualize product, bring in a joint venture partner, and then develop a business plan, develop that product. Uh, we either will sell those buildings uh, or that project upon completion, or we'll lease it. And if we lease it, uh, depending upon you know, what our business plan is, we will then finance for the intermediate term. Um, it, 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 again, if we, when, when, let's, let's take a typical you know, million uh, square foot industrial project. We build three buildings. Uh, you know, we say, okay, here's what we'll sell the product for, here's what we'll lease it for. If the building sells, it sells. If it leases, it leases. We then figure out, okay, do we want to hold that product for some intermediate period of time or do we want to basically then capitalize it and sell it in the marketplace? So our financing strategy is, is really dependent more upon uh, our, our business plan or our business model for a given project. Uh, rarely do we lock into interest, uh, forward interest rates or forward commitments on the front end, um, and rarely do we finance on a long-term basis. To us, long-term is probably 10 years. And so, um, or we, we have a number of projects that we are uh, in mid-cycle today, which we will look out and say, okay, our business plan is to hold this for the next uh, seven to uh, 10 years, so we'll, we'll go put 10-year financing on that. Uh, obviously, we're hoping that today that financing will be accretive to a buyer when they come in in the future. Um, but that's, you know, so essentially our business plan is, is, is to build and develop and to capitalize in the marketplace today. Uh, I, I have my own uh, beliefs on cap rates uh, relative to interest rates, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, in, in a moment. Um, but uh, we're, we're not as sensitive as to where interest rates are going today as we are uh, job formation, the economy, uh, what's happening in the markets that we're developing in. Thanks, John. Um, Doug? We, um, we're not principally a developer, although we engage in some development activity. Our, our investment activity is um, in commercial assets, office, industrial, retail, multifamily. And we've been in the business for a couple of decades, and we primarily pursued value-added strategies where we're investing in existing assets, and there's a business plan that's going to increase the cash flow over a three- to five-year period. And then once we've stabilized the, the cash flow, we're looking to sell and exit. Um, and, you know, I look at you know, where we stand right now. And interest rates affect us in, in a lot of ways, our financing strategy, our assumptions in terms of interest rate impact on cap rates and where your exit valuation is going to be based on an assumed cap rate out in the future. So interest rates affect us dramatically in terms of the way we look at an investment, but we're ultimately trying to create value at the asset level, and we're not looking for the financing to create value for us. We want to try and manage the situation so interest rates don't work against us and, and uh, uh, destroy value. And so we, we look at that from a, from a couple of perspectives. One, you know, is the, is the business plan feasible? Are you going to increase the cash flows over a certain period of time? How confident are you? Uh, what are the risk mitigants there? But you know, to the earlier comments, we are, we're, because we're not necessarily 10-year holders, we did not take advantage of that very attractive fixed rate debt that was available a year or two ago because we didn't want to be locked into that debt subject to yield maintenance or call protection on the, on the, on the part of the lender that would inhibit your ability to sell that asset. And so we were primarily financing at, uh, at, at you know, by historical standards for us, conservative levels. Um, we, we learned uh, some hard lessons in the last crisis in terms of levels at which you finance a value-add situation and you want to be mindful of the cash flow that's in place now 
and finance at a level that supports, is supported by that cash flow and not finance at a level based on future cash flow because you can get into a lot of trouble that way. But it's generally been uh, floating rate debt and we've, uh, we've, we've benefited from that. Mm -hmm. We've had very, very low floating rate debt. The way in which you can mitigate some of your exposure on that floating rate debt is by uh, entering into interest rate uh, caps or swaps. We generally buy insurance through caps and don't swap out because that ends up creating a similar problem for yourself where you have to unwind that swap and interest mm -hmm. rates are still low. So, you know, ultimately we're looking to create value at the asset. Uh, we are mindful in terms of that discussion we had, you know, where's the exit cap rate? You know, we're, we're going to look at, similar to development, we're going to look at what our stabilized cash flow is as a yield on ultimately our investment in that property. And you want to make sure that that yield has a nice cushion above where cap rates trade today and where you think cap rates may be. So if we're looking at uh, properties that right now might trade in the five to six cap rate range, you want an exit cap rate assumption that's going to be a nice cushion that gives you um, some room for that impact of rising interest rates on cap rates. And so we may assume a six and a half, seven, seven and a half percent exit cap rate to give us that cushion. Um, the other thing, though, we, we've been doing is anything that's even remotely stabilized right now, we may not have uh, leased up to 95%. Maybe it's only 88 or 90%. I like the sale market right now. There's still a lot of capital that's coming out uh, looking for stabilized assets. It's a great market to sell into. We're not a long-term holder. We're typically investing out of finite life funds. Why not sell now? Why, why, why hold out for that last... 5% of occupancy, sell now. So we've been a net seller. And then the other thing that we've been doing, we started uh, probably about 10 years ago, is um, we've been a lender. Uh, we, we have, uh, we've been lending money through a mezzanine structure where we'll finance other investors uh, up to, call it 80% of value. They can only get 65% a value from a bank, but they're looking for 80%, and we'll, we'll lend them that money. Um, and I like the risk return profile there because, again, you know, I've got a 20% cushion on the downside. So if, if, if cap rates do rise with interest rates and we run these sensitivities, I still have a nice cushion based on a rise in cap rates that I'm still going to get paid off in full through a sale of that asset even a downside scenario. And so that's something that we've been actively pursuing. So then you have, you have a pricing challenge because if the market isn't looking at the rise in, the, the rise in cap rates, so how, how are you closing that gap? Are you finding deals by using a more conservative exit cap rate? In terms of through our lending program? Really on the buying side. On the buying right? side. Yeah. You know, it's been tough. We, you know, we, we, we have, uh, it's been difficult for us to find good investment opportunities, even in the value add situation. So we, even for a value add program, it's very difficult to invest in some of the primary markets, New York, San Francisco. There's a lot of capital that was core oriented, now is looking to take on a little risk for a lot of the reasons I just described. Right. And yeah. so we're priced out. So we have to look at some of our other markets. Fortunately, we've been active in about 15 to 20 markets. And there are other markets that I think represent better value. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Barham, what are you uh, up to? We have, we have two lines of businesses, the equity and debt. Um, the equity side, we can invest from core to opportunistic. And on the debt side, we have two platforms. Uh, one, we have 50% um, interest in um, square mile capital. And they are really a debt, the mezzanine space investor. And um, I agree with Doug that this is where we see the best risk-adjusted return um, for an investment. And then um, the second component of the debt we are getting into as a life insurance, we have a life insurance company, so we are getting into primary mortgage debt uh, for commercial property, and that's a business we're just starting. Um, on the equity side, um, if you're looking at the core type um, investments, um, 
the 24-7 cities are priced to perfection. So whereas uh, three years ago, we acquired about two billion worth of assets. Um, two years ago, we acquired a billion, and last year, only 500 million. So we've been, we are also a net seller into this marketplace um, of our core assets, um, specifically industrial portfolio and so on. And we started also three years ago, um, what I call a, on the development side, a multifamily development program. Uh, now we have about um, 4,000 units, uh, about $2 billion of development that, are, that is either complete or will be completed o uh, over the course of next 12 months. Um, and while we are continuing with that program, um, I can tell you that we looked at about $4 billion worth of projects the first quarter of this year, and of those, there's three that would interest us. So the number of the markets that are, that are appealing to us um, are shrinking, and they're not cities as markets. We really focus on sub-markets. So it's not Boston. It's a specific sub-market in Boston that we're looking at. Having said that, um, we are much more optimistic about office opportunities, office development opportunities, and that's where we are putting our balance sheet to use. So we are the financer of built to suit, pre-leased, and um, some spec office buildings. So for instance, we have a um, 200, uh, 150,000 square feet office building in the north suburb of Dallas that we're doing purely spec. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and no pre-lease really, no pre commitments for now. Like no pre-lease. Pre in Dallas. In Dallas. Wow. <laughs> um, I so, think he's looking for some little, little mez finance. You know, I'm not going to finance <laughs> mez on that one, no. Where's the love? <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So, um, and, and the reason for what I think the value added and opportunistic is you have bigger spreads. So as Victor is correct, and interest rates are going to come up, you have a bigger margin um, of error, if you would. And if you are buying a core asset in New York City that's priced to perfection, if interest rates go up, um, your downside uh, could be tremendous. So that's, that's one of the reasons we are more in the value added to opportunistic. Um, uh, and if the economy holds, which we believe it will hold, um, that means the liquidity is not taken out of the marketplace. So we think it's going to be a, a good, good time for the developers right now um, for especially office development. So I'm curious, though, on the, so on the Dallas office project, where <laughs> Don't you know, give you, up, construction <laughs> risk, lease up risk, 150,000 square feet, you know, is there an institutional market? on the exit, yeah, probably. But I'm just curious, so, uh, on your assumptions, what is your yield on cost? You're building that to what yield on cost, I, assuming you can lease it up? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't have the specifics, but basically the idea there was um, there, we saw 1.9 million square feet of demand, mm -hmm. and we saw very limited supply. And basically, now there is more supply, but we see about a million square foot coming online. So supply demand still two to one, two, twice and demand for the supply. This would be specific to that sub-market. Yeah. It's that sub-market. That right. So now, you know, we, we will be completing that asset uh, middle of this year, I th I'd say in June. Um, and I think we will be about 60% leased at completion. That's great. And yeah, that's hopefully good. we'll have, we'll have um, you know, lease the rest of the space. Uh, before the year end. But I guess what I'm getting to is is um, is the yield on cost. Then the development. That was a. You 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 underwriting a certain yield to cost, which I think would look attractive if you fulfill your business plan relative to certain cap, certainly cap rates today and probably cap rates where they're going. So that's why I'm asking, you know, where where are you building your developments in terms of a yield to cost, I think that would be. Well, in the, in the, in the markets that we're building, which are primarily the West Coast markets, high, high demand, uh, uh, significant barriers to entry markets in, on the West Coast. Uh, on the industrial side, we're, we try to get to a seven return on cost. Yeah. All in, 
you know, equity carry through stabilization. We're trying to get to a 7%. We think that that product is, is saleable in the marketplace somewhere between a five and a five and a half. So we, we think we've got 200, 150 to 200 basis points of, uh, of, of cushion or yield there. Uh, okay. On the apartment side, uh, you say markets, we're typically building to a 5.6 to 5.75, and again, the, the, the cap rate on that product is probably in the four and a quarter to four and a half. So you're dealing with that, that same uh, margin, somewhere between 150 to 175 basis points. Okay, okay. yellow card. Um, we got one more guy to go, um, and then we're going to go at it. So. That means we totally have to stop. <laughs> Curtis, is never, <laughs> Curtis is never played by the rules. No, and he's not going to today either. But I'm going to give him a chance to play. So, um, Jim, what do you think? So our, our firm believes too many of the real estate market participants are behaving as if artificially manipulated low interest rates and the central bank capital market intervention is normal. I think that the three people you listen to here right now have very specific business plans to deal with those. My comments deal with a broader real estate market than how each one of these individuals articulated specific um, business plans with uh, durations that could deal with movement in interest rates. Whereas in general, with the way buyers are buying poor assets on a long-term basis, I think they've been unrealistic. I think that there is a consistency amongst Calvin's brethren who have spoken about the fact of what I call the hope strategy, that rents will increase disproportionately when interest rates rise, and this will result in a higher NOI that will nullify the negative impacts of the shift in pricing metrics. As you see in the slide that's up on the um, screen, instead of like dealing with the hope strategy, we did the immigrant math ourselves. Okay, this is an engineering math from Cal Poly. And as you can see, uh, the Not slide is going this. When yep. you move from a five cap rate to an exit seven cap rate, and you hold the property five years, to stay even, you have to have compounded NOI growth of 7%. If you go 10 years, you have to have compounded NOI growth of 3.4%. As you move down on the slide, and you move towards seven or 8% and it moves to an 8.5 or a 9 cap rate, you can see that the growth rates are far less. And part of that has to do with the fact that cap rates and interest rates aren't incremental. They're, they move geometrically. That's why when John just spoke about building to a 5 and a quarter, 5 and a half, and selling at a 4 and a quarter, 4 and a half, there's a multiple there that provides you a greater profit margin than when you move from an eight cap rate to a seven cap rate. Right. So if you could move to the next slide, please. So if you look at this slide, you can see on the bottom, we just use a $100,000, well, let, let's use a nine cap rate, because historically everything's a nine. So <laughs> That's right. It's a true. Well, when you're at five cap rates, you're at 200000 so if you just move from a five to a nine, you're going to lose 50% of your capital just in the shift in those pricing metrics. And they have, you know, it's, it's geometric movement both ways. Now it's really great when it's going down, and John and I, I know for a fact, benefited from that contraction in, in um, interest rates, and it was very beneficial for us. So we. Unlike John, who's got a pool of like 10 or 12 different institutional capital partners uh, for different strategies, we raise all of our money in advance. So my partner and I co-invest our money with pension funds and endowments and family offices and international investors. 
We've been in business 30 years, and as a result, we're blessed with the fact that our funds are 15, 20 year funds. Um, so we invest in general for seven to 20 years. So just like the private equity industry right now is having difficulty, they're much more realistic at looking at their pricing on their exit, and that's why private equity investing has diminished in the last few years, because they can't get their models to work with their higher interest rate assumption five years out. Because a lot of times in private equity deals, you can't go and execute. John can go build an industrial building, get it up, get it leased in a nine to 18 month period of time on a lot of his projects. On a private equity deal, it could take you three to seven years to turn around a company. So the part that I think that is the big disconnect in the broader real estate market today is to not lose principle, one has to make an assumption. What's a market-driven 10-year uh, risk-free interest rate? And then you've got to devise and implement a development and investment program that will function relative to that change in interest rates and capitalization rates. And I think both, all these gentlemen have done a great job sharing with you strategies that will work. But in the broader market right now, when you listen to the institutional investors, they're going into core investing, acting like long-term long investors, and uh, as William Sharp, the Nobel laureate um, uh, for, you know, for, uh, uh, what did he get it for? Finance, econo economics. There you go. He, he, the guy who created the Sharp Ratio and Modern Portfolio Theory, He's a very funny man. He goes, reversion to the mean is mean. And it doesn't, you don't always go back to the mean. You overshoot the mean and come back. And as a result, uh, when interest rates normalize, Janet Yellen quits screwing around with her view of the world and the market takes over. Interest rates, even Bernanke and these people are talking about, four to five and a half percent risk-free rate. That's right. Yeah. So if yeah. you go then take a normal spread, which is 150 to 250 basis point interest rate spread over the risk-free rate, lo and behold, you're looking at six and a half to seven and a half percent interest rate. And at a six percent interest rate with a 30-year amortization, you got a seven three constant and if you got a 25-year RAM, you got a 7-8 constant. You see how you're starting to move back towards uh, 6.5 to 7.5 <laughs> cap rate. So what we're doing as a firm, and we closed eight deals in the fourth, in the fourth quarter, all we're focused is on are transactions that we can stabilize between 7.5 to 9.5% return on cost by the third year. And we were deploying it by buying busted assets that are <coughs> institutional in character, but due to lease structure, physical condition, aren't institutional. They can't attract any kind of bank debt. We close all cash. We bought a golf course that we're entitling that will build probably about a million two hundred thousand square feet in eight or nine buildings over five years with. A return on cost of seven and a half to eight and a half percent. We've been buying self storage and apartments in dislocated markets. This is why he's so successful. So I'm just trying to give you guys a sense, you know, what's there. So, Jim, are you telling John that he's crazy? No, I'm not, because John's strategy, you have to be, you listen very carefully when John talks. Because. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> he doesn't, doesn't say much. They're competitors, by the way. Very quickly, and he, he outlined very nuanced strategies where he can move very quickly within nine to twenty month strategies, and then he also spoke about longer term strategy. But he's very focused in terms of matching his asset and his source of money relative to his promote and his money, and that's the same thing um, our firm is doing. Um, in terms of the money. Now, he'll match up shorter term money for shorter term projects, and he'll match up longer term capital with longer term projects. 
So the key is, is how are you going to create a portfolio of different opportunities with different, um, uh, um, so, so you don't get wiped out. So John Hussman, who's a big investor, he's got the greatest line of all. You either look stupid before the bubble burst, or you look stupid after the bubble burst. But everybody's going to look stupid in this process. <laughs> but tell us what you really think. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, you're holding it back. I know you are. What do you want me to say? <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do you think about um, Barham strategy based on what you just said? I don't know what his return on cost is, which is why I laughed about Doug. <laughs> 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 it's like the return on cost is, d defines the whole key when you're using other people's money. The number one rule is don't lose the money. They'll piss, <laughs> they'll moan, they'll tell you you're stupid. But as long as you get them their money back, they'll put up with a lot of stuff. If you go lose the money, it's tough. So one of the things with the higher <laughs> you know they're going to get their money back. I want to get it, my money but it back. All, but it all starts with the buy. It all starts, yes. it yep, all starts right. with the acquisition. If, 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 you make a, if you make a bad acquisition of land or, or asset to, 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 for a value add, you, you, you can never get ahead of the power curve. So it all, starts, it all starts with the acquisition. A lot of the money that's being made today was actually started you know, two years ago. You know, I mean, it two seems years like ago. there's a note of caution in the wind here. I, I want to say that from a real economy perspective, I didn't touch on this, I'm fairly optimistic, right? GDP growth in the U.S. is expected to be 2.8% this year. Uh, Do you think they're going to get there? That's 80 basis points above the four-year average of around 2%. I mean, Do you think it's going to be there? Uh, I, I'm willing. I'm Come on, putting Victor. my stake in the ground and saying it's going to get there. Now, with that said, I have a friend flying over to the Council of Foreign Relations later today talking about potential drone strikes in the Crimea region. Hopefully, that doesn't accelerate into, into anything. But... With that said, that translates to 200, 250,000 jobs a month on average. I mean, that's, that's above good. the 195. The but real economy is doing okay. With that said, what that means for interest rate policy mean, is also that the Federal Reserve will have a little bit more ammo to go and say, we're going to get to that 4.5% long-term well, view, I, I, maybe I, a little I, bit sooner than we and think. And I think so, they will. I mean, I think, you know, uh, interest rates have been held down artificially for a significant period of time. And, and Jim and I and all of us have been the beneficiary of this. I mean, you know, we're, we're financing, you know, on the short term at, you know, 2.5%. Uh, I mean, you look, you look pretty smart when you can go out and finance at 60 65%, at 2.5%, and you're yielding 7%. Uh, interest rates are going to increase. So the question is, you know, how do you, how do you factor that into what you're doing? How do you, you know, how do you, you know, you... you we were basically on the apartment side, which, which to us, on the industrial side, we're much more transactional. I mean, we're, again, you know, we're building buildings in, in, in the markets that we're building in. A lot of people are buying. So the, in, in the user market, I think Doug had mentioned it, the user market has been very, very strong. Um, and so, you know, we're much more transactional. On the multifamily side, which more, we're much more of a portfolio company, and we're looking at, at, you know, we buy a project, okay, we're going to do a value add, okay, we're going to put short-term debt on there to create value, then we're going to go out and finance for 10 years. You know, we're, we're really looking, at, if we finance for 10 years, we're looking at, okay, what are the, what are the prepayment penalties? What are the, what are the, the, uh, uh, the penalties, what are the covenants on, on the debt? Can we put secondary debt on? Because what we don't want is for that, you know, for, for all of a sudden that apartment to continue to escalate in value, seven years we sell it and we find we've got a 40% loan to value and that becomes a detriment or a hurdle in, in our finance, or excuse me, in our sales structure. So, um, you know, that's, we're, we're constantly looking at that. On the industrial side, we're much more transactional. And you know, if we like the market, and, and, and if somebody will step up and buy uh, on, a, on a very advantageous basis, we'll sell. If not, we'll hold. I don't get so hung up on cap rates. I mean, I, you know, in the markets that we're in, you know, you, you take advantage of the marketplace. If all of a sudden cap rates start to move up and it becomes uncomfortable or uneconomical to sell, you sit on it. We're in a cyclical marketplace, right. you know? We're gonna, it's going to come back. I mean, we didn't sell a lot of product in the, in the 9, 10, 11 time frame because obviously the markets were crappy. But, if you, but, if, you, but if you built it, if you, if you built it to uh, an attractive yield on cost 
and uh, you, you have that luxury. What, 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 if you're a, what if you're a buyer of a core stabilized asset today at a four and a half to five percent cap rate? Well, I mean, we're you're, not in that business, so I, yeah, you know, I, know I don't, I don't like business, that model. But I'm coming back to the comment <laughs> right. we heard earlier. Well, the you know, economy, the economy could, you know, it's it's good. It could get a little bit better, but but that that that's sort of priced into this core pricing, that expectation, and and what are the downside risks in terms of future cap rate exit, and, and what are your cash flows looking like? Are you going to be in a, in a core stabilized asset, which is leased up, where's the, where's the upside in the, in the cash flow? Well, they're not uh, looking for upside. They're looking for cash return. So, so like, we're, we've been selling off, um, like, we just sold a Chase Bank at, like, a three and three quarters cap rate. This guy comes in with his wife. They're, like, a zillion years old. <laughs> and, you know, they pay three and three quarters. Well, their whole deal is they want cash. And, it's like they're, you know, they're with the strategy for retirement. They're not going to see the reversion. Right. And they can't, they, go, they can't get cash return anywhere. They're living off the cash return. Now, when these pension funds... And you took advantage of them? Yeah, how did you do that? <laughs> I gave them a You wanted what's best. <laughs> I didn't use a gun. I didn't force anybody. I gave them a choice. So the part is, is these pension funds, they're investing the core. These guys are going to get wiped out. Look at this curve. <laughs> I mean, they are going to take a hickey beyond a hickey. And um, they got like a hand grenade in their pocket with a pin pull. And it's not going to be pretty. And uh, at the same time, they're going, to, they're going to say that their pension consultants told them it was OK. And they did everything like all the others did. But, you know, my mother taught me just because everybody else jumps off the pier doesn't mean you jump off the pier. Can, the, can, the, rest, can the rest of us provide a disclaimer that we don't necessarily agree to everything that Jim says? Yeah. <laughs> no, maybe 5%, but we're not going to tell you which 5%. So, um, so, so Jim, if you're, if you're or maybe we should ask Barham this, if you're, the, if you're the manager, right, of that fund, what happens to you when that event happens? Well, I, I guess first, first I would say I agree with Jim and his strategy as far as being on value added. So what, he, what you describe is you buy an asset that can be improved and, and become core. So he's manufacturing um, that yield. So, and that could be value added, could be opportunistic as well. And then, then he has the margin built in. So if the interest rates goes up, he's protected. I'm a buyer of that strategy. Um, if you're a core investor, to your, your point, um, I would be very cautious today, unless I have a 10, 15 year hold horizon, which you know, some institutions like Audia, you know, GIC, they, they may. Um, and you, know, you say, OK, I'll buy it. This is a, a, re a replaceable asset that I want to hold for long term. And I'm going to weather this storm with it because I want to have exposure and I want to have that 4.5% where you know, I'm not getting anything from the treasuries. Look, I, I think a core strategy can work over a longer period of time, you know, 10 years plus. I think the, the real Despite risk. Despite of today's yeah, pricing. Yeah, even at today's pricing. I, I personally would actually you know, uh, do it on a leverage basis. You know, if the cash flows are set for 10 years, find the attractive long-term fixed rate financing. No, so you're, you're, so, you're, so now all of a sudden your cash yield, you're going to get all your money back on cash yield over 10 years and you, know, you, you see what happens on the reversion 10 years out. What that, do you think, that, Jim? I, like if you flip the slide back, <laughs> you're going to see, I, I just don't think you can get the NOI growth to get out on your initial cash when you look at these numbers. And I, I'm old enough to have lived through the late 70s and early 80s and we just didn't see any kind of NOI growth during a period of time when there was 16% inflation on these numbers. Because remember, this yeah. is NOI growth. So your expenses are growing too exactly. when your rent's yeah. growing. Exactly. So when the reason I use the NOI growth here is, hey, what on a net basis do you need to achieve? I, I was in a room with Gerson Baker, who's a very mm -hmm. famous apartment owner and developer on the West Coast. And they were having an argument on rent control, and they were going to put a limit on 7% rent growth a year. And all these apartment owners were complaining, you know, we don't want a cap. And Gerson stood up and said, 
we should get down on our knees and kiss the earth if we get 7% mm -hmm. compound exactly. growth <laughs> for eight years. It just doesn't happen, yeah. We, we, we just had it for four or five. It's right. not there anymore in apartments. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the issue I think for apartments, which you noted already, is that number one, at least as far as national data from our firm is concerned, we hit effective rent growth peaks in 2012. It was at 3.9. Right. In 2013, it's begun to slow. Yeah. And as you said, all of these new apartment buildings are mostly Class A apartments, which usually require larger expense and capital investment to maintain. Sure. Higher cost, right? And so when I see these projections of 2 to 3% of capital value per year to maintain Class A status, uh, that's probably underestimated by a third. I mean, we, we watch the, uh, the West Coast apartment markets, uh, you know, literally on a weekly basis yeah. because we own apartments all up and down the coast. The only market in the West is Coast... Is it still resilient? I mean, what? Oh, yeah, it yeah. is resilient. Yeah. But the only market in the West Coast that's had above, you know, a 5% uh, compounded rent increase over the last two years is the Peninsula and right. San, right. San Francisco. San Francisco. Everything, everything, right. else, is below, everything right. else is below right. that. But so, I mean, to, to, to Jim's San point... Francisco in the last two quarters is softened. Concessions have increased and uh, the number of units moving is... It's just gone up so, but so that was, fast. But that, so that was rent increase. You need to translate to, to Jim's NOI increase, right? Because there is some... Oh, yeah, no question. Oh, yeah. No, that's, no, that, that's, no, that's, no, that's, yeah. 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 that's strictly rent increase. Right, yeah. right. 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 So, um, you in the audience, if you, if you want, just go to a microphone, interject, tell Jim that, or Curtis that he's full, full of it or not. Um, but so let's just shift for a second and say what happens, we don't know why, right? We don't know whether it's interest rates, we don't know whether it's no growth, we don't know whether it's an event. What happens if the market gets illiquid? You know, <laughs> We've seen that uh, before. <laughs> yeah. No, I, we, we have and, and, and Curtis brought it up. Yeah. So, you know, based on our, our individual plans, the market becomes you know, Ill illiquid, you've probably thought about that. So, you know, maybe Doug, you, you start and we'll work around and we'll just Absolutely. Say, what, what lessons, do we do? Lessons learned, I mean, we saw uh, probably, and we talked about this as a group, um, we saw just unbelievable illiquidity um, in the capital markets coming out of the uh, financial crisis. Um, and it started before the failure of Lehman. We, Actually, almost a year prior to Lehman, the commercial mortgage-backed security market dried up, and that was the, the, the proverbial canary. Um, right. And uh, it just, you know, steamrolled from there. And you had, um, you know, it was piling on, right? Because the capital markets, the debt capital markets dried up, so you couldn't refinance your property. Uh, prospective buyers of your property could not get financing, so the sale market dried up. Uh, you had uh, the recession starting to heat up, so now you were coming under pressure in terms of your cash flows to support your debt service in place. You had impending maturities with no refinancing market, no sale market, valuations declining, and it was, uh, it was a nightmare. Uh, if you go back, you know, a couple cycles, and we had some mini cycles there that we talked about in terms of the Russian ruble crisis and the tech uh, bubble burst, but the great one uh, prior was really, 91. you know, late, late 80s into the early SNL. 90s and, SNL, and, yeah. and SNL crisis. So you had, again, some illiquidity in the debt capital markets. But a lot of that was, you know, we just didn't have very well-developed capital markets. You didn't have the securitization that had kicked in. There was no CMBS market. It was just banks and insurance companies who were your lenders. Not much beyond that. The REIT market hadn't developed in terms of equity securitization. And you had a situation where you had massive uh, supply coming online relative to the supply in stock. And that was almost a supply-led uh, illiquidity uh, where it the banks- didn't help. Yeah, yeah where, the, where, the, where the banks, the banks and the insurance companies pulled back because they had their own issues. So what, what do you do? You know, what, what do you do? What do you do? What, what do you do? You, I think to the comment I heard earlier, you, you, uh, you finance at levels that are comfortable based on the cash flow, and you, if you have to uh, hold back some equity from your capital partners to be able to delever to get an extension, you hold on. You hold on. You hunker down. Yeah. I'd say if, um, if you're a core investor and you have a long-term horizon, liquidity does, doesn't matter. You're going to ride it out. 
because you have staying power, and by the virtue of being a core investor, you're lower leveraged. So you'd be leveraging about 40, maybe 50 percent at best. But if you are at the other extreme, and you're a merchant builder, you're going to get caught. And that's you know because your your whole strategy is based on um, building, leasing, and selling, and the selling and maybe some of the leasing because the liquidity is going to happen because of some major event. It just doesn't happen by itself. So leasing may be jeopardized or will be at risk, and selling will be at risk. So if you're a private equity fund or what have you, you most likely you would be lucky if you return the capital, as Jim was saying, and you may have to take a haircut. Yeah, you know, I, it, I, we're talking I, about I, I the... I disagree here because oh. I've, I've, seen, I've seen John, he's very smart in picking partners that will weather that, that component of the storm. And that's what I talked about earlier about having a portfolio of, a, of investors to be able to deal with those uh, realities at that time. The big lesson we learned we sold two-thirds of our portfolio in 07 and um, 06. Then we left the market, and then all of a sudden, the public markets fell apart, the securitized market fell apart. We saw huge opportunities. We had this one deal to take over this whole component of this publicly traded company, and we, and, you know, we could have taken them to their knees. The problem was, we didn't have the, the money lined up. So the big lesson that we learned as a firm is that we needed to be more like Saris Regis, and we went and diversified our sources of funds, not just from pension funds, but a wide variety of different um, players who would appreciate uh, illiquidity. So we didn't take everybody who wanted to come into the fund, we looked at each partner as to what could they do if the market goes, goes really south and if they were from different areas of the world. So that's another way we dealt with that element. So you, you raised the public market. And, and just for a second, you know, everybody here pretty much, um, I guess except for me, who sits on the board of a publicly traded company. So I'm just going to bring this up. Um, the public markets have grown, have continued to grow. And they are, um, they, have a, they have an influence. So one, you know, what, what kind of influence does it, during the, during the crisis, even if you had very low leverage in your company, but your stock price went down so far that you were breaking covenants, and, you know, the market was falling apart f for those reasons. So how does that impact the private sector, if at all, in your mind? Well, it's a huge opportunity for the private yeah. market to attack the public if, market. If you're breaking covenants, then, then theoretically you've got to sell assets in order to raise capital to get back in, in, in compliance. So, well, we, yeah. saw, we saw that happen. So, we saw retail companies so, in, so, in you particular. Know, that's, 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 those are the kinds of opportunities that you know, Jim and I like. Now, the, the difficulty <laughs> is, yeah, is right. that you know, when, when you have those kinds of conditions and you have illiquid markets, you know, everybody is questioning their decisions. Everybody is saying, well, you know, I know I can buy this at uh, $60 a, a square foot, but, you know, is the value really 50? Right. I mean, or 40. You want to catch a falling knife, right? Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 exactly. Trying to catch the falling knife. So, I mean, you know, you'll, Ill, you know, the, the illiquid markets are, are both, uh, you know, a blessing and a curse. I mean, they provide some opportunities if you have your shop in order, and, and, and as Jim said, you know, when, when, when those events happen, you, you just hope that you haven't kind of gone too far and, 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 that, and that, you know, you're, that, you're, that in, your, in your portfolio is, is of a nature to where you can manage it and you don't have to continually worry about debt refinancings. Um, you know, so that you can take advantage of those opportunities well, that are out of there. Speaking of debt, yeah, debt refinancing. So, according to Victor's forecast, we're going to see a downturn. Which is right. Which is, of course, right. We're going to see a downturn in 2016. We do have a publicly traded debt market that there's probably some debate on as to whether or not uh, these CMBS loans that are coming due are going to be able to refinan be refinanced. 
And I know there are lots of, there's lots of people looking at those deals right now, uh, especially with you know, the slow growth that we've had. We haven't had a lot of, a lot of job growth in, in that area. So you know, what do you guys think about that as an opportunity? Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll comment briefly. I mean, I, I think it is a huge opportunity. Uh, if you look at uh, a lot of people were doing 10-year fixed rate financing, and that was originated in 05, 06, 07 at, at very high valuations. And we haven't seen the cash flows in many situations come back to the levels that were uh, being priced at that point in time. So when those loans come up for maturity, um, and I think it's 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 a lot. It's a, it's over a trillion. No, it's a lot. It's a yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of money. It's a trillion yeah. in in that three year period, and if you look at uh, the cash flows being generated by those assets that were financed ten years ago, um, uh, the cash flows today will not support a refinancing that will take that debt out. So there there is a financing market, but it's not it's not going to take out that. Uh, got senior that loan. Hole, right. So it's going to be a combination of a new senior loan, potentially a MES loan. We're providing mezzanine debt into that refinancing market and or fresh equity right. that will take care of that refinancing. Otherwise, it's a forced sale. So yeah. it will create opportunity. So is, is that a... And then the other part that you didn't just... A lot of these assets are cash starved because the financial institutions have been stripping off all the cash flow at 3 or 4% because that's a positive spread because they've been paying 0% on their money to the feds. So 300, 400 basis point spread is huge for those financial institutions. But now as the fed begins to move up the interest rate, the spread goes away, you know, they're going to want those assets off their, off their books. So pretend and extend will come to an abrupt stop. And these assets aren't just going to deal with the value. They're going to need money put into the buildings because no money's gone into the buildings for five or eight years. So is, it, is that a big enough event that, you know, Victor, that you see that altering the interest rate pattern at that particular time? You know, is, is that another place where we, we might see intervention of sorts and, and give John and Jim another opportunity to go back into it? Well, what seems to be indicative would be in 05, 06, 07, we also didn't just issue 10-year term CMBS loans. We also issued a lot of five-year terms. It wasn't as large as the 10-year term bubble. We saw a lot of these deals actually come up for refinancing over the last few years. They kind of stumbled along and there were opportunities to be had. I'm not sure that that market would be necessarily large enough to turn the tide against the overall interest rate directionality it's at this point. It's a blip on the radar screen. Yeah. I, I don't believe it's going to increase interest rates. And more importantly, having had with the Fed president, he, he doesn't think commercial real estate is even relevant. So. <laughs> It's so, <laughs> true, <laughs> except from a regulation standpoint. Right. Other, so, so to think because commercial, <laughs> residential, what's the difference? Taxation, yeah. I'm very right. Income now, generating. Right? Not, <laughs> what's the difference? So, I don't think the Fed really it's cares true, what though. goes on in commercial real estate. If it's impacting the banks, then they're concerned. Otherwise, they're not. Yeah. Well, and most of those aren't. So we're right. we're starting to run out of time here. Does Does anybody in the audience have a question? Are you believing all of this forecasting that's that's going on? Because it's right. Why? Because you're an economist. That's right. No. Because it's right. Yeah. <laughs> how, many, how many in the audience think that interest rates are going to go up? Okay. That's how many people in the well, audience we, we, think we, we, that no, 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 interest no, no, rates are going to go up? Come on. Put a time frame <laughs> on that. I mean, you know. They're, they're going to go up. I mean, the follow on question is how many people think that the interest rate rise, regardless of when, will result in a rise in cap rates? Everyone. Just about everyone. How many don't think that? No one. <laughs> well, well, wait a minute. You got some. You got to. Right, here we go. <laughs> well, Tell us why. <laughs> guys are afraid. You're the only one that raised his hand. They're afraid of me. This is a friendly discussion. Really, really really yeah. I'm being afraid. I set you up. <laughs> I'm the fall guy. I gave you. I gave you a window in okay. the short run. Uh, no, John. John. John is much more nuanced. He's got a great response to this question. Give him space, guys. Yeah, we will. Cap rates, first of all, 
cap rates is a is a universal term. It's a universal term that's that's applied to all product types, you know, in, in all different geographical areas. So, my my comment in relative to cap rates and interest rates, it, it really pertains more to Class A product and Class A markets. Okay, I'm not talking about a 30,000 square foot industrial building in Columbus, Ohio, or a uh, an apartment project in Laredo, or, Texas. Or Jim's Bank Branch. Yeah, or Jim's Bank Branch. I mean, I, I'm referring to Class A product, office, industrial, retail, multifamily, and Class A markets. And, and, and I believe, and I have for a long time, and I think history will support this, is that there is not a direct correlation between cap rates and interest rates. And and as as interest rates continue to move up over time, and I, which I believe they will, I think cap rates are going to continue to stay low, okay? When, when interest rates, when the 10-year gets above 5%, you may begin to see cap rates creep up a little bit. Not on a, not on a, a parallel basis, but you may see it, it to increase a little bit. The reason I say this is that the, the world today is awash with capital. There's so much capital in the marketplace. That's true. And that if, if interest rates start to move up, then the buyers of that Class A product are just basically going to just fund more equity or put more equity in and not use debt. Today, as an example, let's say a, a, a buyer goes out and buys a, a Class A industrial building in Southern California, and they pay a five cap rate, and they can go out and get 50% financing at a, at a low four. Okay? They're, creating, they're, they're creating a positive cash flow by putting that financing in place. Maybe it's five-year I.O. and, and five-year amortization. They're creating positive cash flow by putting that financing in place. That's accretive. If all of a sudden interest rates start to move up and they can't create accretive financing, they'll just buy for all cash, uh, and they'll hold that. And, and they'll hold it because they believe they're buying an asset in an escalating market. So, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a necessary correlation between, between cap rates and interest rates. The primary reason being is, this is, is that there's so much capital in the marketplace and there's going to be more capital tomorrow and more capital after that. And, you know, there's not enough alternative investment uh, areas of, out there to absorb all of this capital. More and more of it's coming into real estate. That's your, that's your final statement? That's my final statement. Anybody else want to challenge that? Or we yeah, sort I'll, of I'll take that. I'll take that. So if I'm a pension fund and I can buy a, a core asset in a market like New York or San Francisco for 4 5%, cap rate, which by the way you can't do right now, it's lower than that, but assume you can. And I have the opportunity to buy a 10-year treasury rate mm -hmm. at four and a half or five percent. A lot of that institutional capital will now shift money from a real estate allocation back into fixed income. And so I don't think you're going to quite see the same Okay, but, but, wow. but that pension fund has, has an investment criteria where it has to, or, or it doesn't have to. Mm -hmm. It has guidelines that say we're going to invest 5% in real estate, we're going to invest 10% here, 20% yep. here, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, they're not all of a sudden going to say, okay, we now see the cap rates in Class A real estate product in major markets dipping so low that we're going to take all that money and we're going to put it into five-year treasuries or 10-year treasuries. They're still... Going to, going to buy assets in that marketplace because in a 10-year treasury, all you're buying is an income stream. Okay? You buy a piece of real estate, you're buying an income stream and the possibility of future appreciation. Okay? And even if they do, you have sovereign capital and foreign capital out there that's prepared to jump in and, and, and buy that asset at that cap rate. So I just don't, I just, it's, it's not a perfect system. The other part, the other part of real estate today being used as a substitute for currency risk because the reason people are buying all these places in New York and in London is they're using them as a substitute because they don't trust U.S. Treasury. They don't trust the euro. They don't trust gold. So as a result, they can get a hard asset. There's not direct correlation immediately, but on a longer term basis, they can be very defensive. So that's why the Russians and the Chinese 
are moving so much money. So when, China, when Canada just changed the law in the last six weeks about immigration, there was a tremendous inflow of capital into the United States and, and because it's been known to be coming over the last six months. And you can see a noticeable shift on the West Coast to uh, assets being purchased um, by, the, by the Chinese. One of the top brokers in San Francisco, he sold seven deals in the fourth quarter. They were all sold to Chinese investors. You had, you had three major transactions in downtown Los Angeles, land transactions in downtown Los Angeles, which by everybody's acknowledgments has been a sick market for a long, long time. Long time. Long time. All Asian capital. Mm -hmm. All yeah. Asian capital. Major transactions. So, so one thing with sovereign wealth funds. Jimmy, this is the this is the this is a final comment because everybody has to go okay. to their lunch. So we'll. Oh yeah. Uh, you you in particular. Yeah. Because you're introducing somebody. Um, make your comment. Hey, it's been great. <laughs> <laughs> How about we thank our panelists? Thank you for coming, everybody.